there are a number of ways to look at friction acting as centripetal force. We'll look at what happens with a car making a turn. And if you look at a car, uh, let's say it's moving in this direction. Uh, and if its wheels turn like this, okay, uh, the friction would be preventing the car from going forward like that. Inertia would carry it forward. If it were on a sheet of ice, inertia would carry it forward. But if it's not on a sheet of ice, then friction would be acting in this direction here on both wheels, which is what everybody would like. And the direction the car would take is, is this way. The wheels would be able to go in that direction. This would essentially would be the path of least resistance. And the car would go off in the direction in which you pointed the wheels. And uh, the static friction is responsible, in this case, for turning the vehicle. Um, if you were on, as I say, if you were on gravel, very loose gravel or ice, the car would just go straight. Let's look at it a little more, in a little more detail. Here's a circular track, and the car is going around like this on a circular track. The friction would be acting in, pointed in like this, um, as the car goes around the track, in the direction that the centripetal acceleration would be acting. If we take this track, now this track is, let's call this the view from above. Let's take a different look at the track. Let's look at the track like this. Here's the car here. The car is going into, there's the driver, the car is going into the page. And we're looking at the back of the vehicle. The car is going into the page. It's going to come around, make a circle around this track here. And this would be, let's say, a view. If I can spell that. View from behind the car. And so let's label the forces on this vehicle. And let's just move this a little bit up out of the way there and um, the forces of course are going to be the weight of the vehicle that's going to be a mass times gravity you're going to have the ground holding the vehicle up that's going to be the normal force and the direction of the acceleration is directed inward like this remember this is we're looking at the back of the vehicle going around the turn the axis of the rotation is going to be right here. And so the frictional force acts which way? In the direction of the acceleration. That is the static friction. That is providing the centripetal force. Um, and so there are the three forces on that vehicle. Now, what we want to do is analyze what happens with that force what how do we associate velocity and and the coefficient of friction let's see how we do that if i take the sum of the forces in the x direction and we'll call this we'll call this the plus x direction because that's the direction of our acceleration that will be plus y so the sum of the forces in the x direction equals m a but not just any a centripetal a it's a centripetal acceleration because that's the only acceleration present he, we're assuming the car is traveling at a constant rate of speed well the only force acting on it is centripetal is um, the static friction which is the centripetal force and so that's m and a can be a sub c can be replaced by v squared divided by r okay well the centripetal, we want to push the centripetal um, velocity to a maximum. So we want this to be the maximum static friction. And the maximum static friction is given by 
this equation. Fs max is going to equal mu sub s f sub n, mean normal force. Ordinarily, ordinarily, static friction is an inequality, if you recall. But this is the equation we're going to utilize, and so therefore we're going to sub in mu sub s f sub n equals m v squared over r. All right, so, so far, so good. Uh, but we don't really want the normal force. We want the values in terms of mass and gravity and things like that. And if you look at the diagram up here, you'll see that the normal force should be equal to mg. Right. And so we have mu sub s times mass times gravity. We're replacing the f sub n with that equals mv squared over r. And now you should see that on each side of the equation, what variable exists. If you said mass, you're correct. And so therefore, we can cancel that m out, m cancels, and we get mu sub s g equals v squared over r, or v squared equals mu sub s r g. Finally, we can then write that v equals the square root of the static coefficient of friction, the radius, times gravity. This is our equation. If you were a civil engineer, you would use this equation to determine what is the maximum velocity around a term. Let's look at a quick example of this type of calculation. Let's say let uh, mu sub s between, I'll say, a tire, rubber tire, and the road is equal to 0 0.95. And also, let's say the radius of the turn is, uh, we'll say, um, 50 meters. Okay, that's about 160, 170 feet. Uh, and, uh, we want to find the maximum velocity at which we can take that turn. Okay, well now we just essentially use that equation uh, because we already analyzed it and um, we're going to have V equals the square root of 0 0.95 times the radius, which is 50, times 9.8. And in terms of units, let's see what we're looking at here. 0.95 has no units. 50 is meters, and 9.8 um, is meters per second squared. So we end up in meters squared per second squared, and we're taking the square root, so that leaves us with meters per second. So the units do work out correctly. Now let's just see what this comes out to. So I've got 0.95 times 50 times 9.8. That's going to equal 465, and we want the square root of that. So it's 21.57 meters per second. So V is going to equal 21.6 meters per second. And so, if you were a designer, of course, now that works out to, well, let's do one other quick calculation. Um, let's bring the calculator in here. We have 21.6 times 3,600 seconds per hour divided by 1609 meters uh, per mile. And if we enter that, we see that it's about 48 miles an hour. So if you were a designer, you would probably want to design this, say, for a maximum of 35. You'd build in the safety factor. And, of course, when it rains, the coefficient would be lower as well.